about you, but uh, this season right now feels exactly like that, doesn't it? Just that chaos going on again and again and again. Hey, my name's Carrie. I'm one of the pastors here at Beach, and we are starting this brand new series called Peace in the Chaos. Uh, And just in case you're wondering, yes, we chose your specific news outlet to put on that just to make you upset. Kidding. (laughs) Kidding. Hey, we, uh, we really believe that this is a time that God wants to lean in and wants us to lean into him in this moment of chaos. And we believe that there's an ability to have peace in this season, even in all of the chaos that we are specifically experiencing. And one of the things that we believe about God is that he is a lack, He is active, he is alive, he is for us as his people, as his children. And specifically, one of the ways that I know that and I believe that is the fact that we are doing this specific series, Peace in the Chaos. And the reason I say that is, this isn't just a nice little series that we're doing because of the current situation that we're in, this series began to be planned back last fall. And as our teaching team and as Pastor Jerry uh, really were praying through what is it that God has for us and our church and what message would he have us bring during this season post-Easter in 2020, it was this specific series. And so we began praying through this last fall. We did our whole brainstorming session on it in January before there was any sense that what was happening right now would actually be happening. And yet here we find ourselves in the midst of a lot of chaos with a lot of people wondering where is the peace and how can I ever have peace again in my life or maybe I never had peace to start with and this has just made it a whole lot more chaotic. And so what I'm really excited about is that in this series, we really believe that God's gonna bring us to a place where we can actually have peace in the chaos of life. Now, coronavirus isn't the only thing that creates chaos in our lives. We can all agree on that. There are all kinds of things that create chaos in our lives, whether that's broken relationships, lost jobs, lost income that's coming in. There are all kinds of ways that chaos comes up in our lives. And for us as people, we are naturally wired to want that peace, those moments in that opening video where it was just, uh, We desire that and we long for that. That was the beginning of our relationship with God. And so we as people, we naturally seek out ways to have peace. Some of the ways we seek out peace are maybe through relationships, maybe with family members, maybe with friends and being with them we we hope uh, will bring us peace and and bring us connection with other people. Uh, Some of the ways that we try and find peace in the midst of chaos is we turn to work and we turn to achievement and we turn to gaining and moving forward and we say, hey, if I can just, if I can just get a little further, I can be in more control and there will be less chaos because of what I control. For some of us, we try and find peace in the midst of chaos by numbing that chaos. We turn to things like alcohol. We turn to things like drugs. We turn to things like pornography or sex because we're trying to numb that chaos that we're feeling because we seek and desire and we long for peace. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here tuning in in this specific worship service because you long for peace and you know, you've tried a number of those things that I just talked about and you find, man, maybe for a little bit, they bring you peace, but the same thing always comes back over and over again. You start getting a little peace and then that chaos comes back. And so specifically, as we go through this series, as we go through these next eight, nine weeks, we want to be able to get to a place where we can have peace in the midst of chaos. Because all of the things of this world that offer peace to us ultimately fail us in the end, and we gotta keep coming back for more and more and more. And so as we prayed through this series and really tried to answer some of the key questions as to why 
should we do this series and why would God lead us to this series, there were a couple of statements uh, really that came to mind. The first one, we want people to experience God's best life for them. That's what we desire as a church. We desire, and as your pastors, we desire that you would experience God's best life for you. We believe that God desires good things for you in your life. He has a love that's so grand and so rich and so full, and he wants that for you. God is not trying to take something from you or to keep you from things that, that are actually good for you. He instead wants you to experience an amazing life. And here's what we believe about that life. We specifically believe that being grounded in God's word and wisdom brings peace in our chaos. That when we are grounded in his word and his wisdom, that, that we can have peace even when things are crazy all around us. Because here's one of the things that we believe about our God. We believe that he created life. And as the creator of life, he knows his intention for how life would be lived. And so while I might have an opinion on that, ultimately, I'm not the one that created life. So my opinion means little up next to the God who actually created life and knew his intentions on how life, how relationships, how all of that would actually work best. Now that doesn't mean we can't use life in ways that are different from how the creator intended, but part of what that means is when we use our lives in ways that are different, we may not get the fullness out of them that he originally intended for us to have. And so we may come to these places in our life where we have chaos and we're seeking peace, and our heavenly father says to us, hey, hey, hey I want you to have peace in the midst of the chaos going on. In fact, I've given you my word and my wisdom so that you can have peace in your chaos. And so maybe you're joining us today and specifically you've not had a relationship with God, you've not been a follower of Jesus, somehow you just stumbled onto the worship service or maybe someone invited you in or maybe you had a lot of chaos in this season so you're seeking, you're searching for something and you're willing to give anything a try at this point. What I want you to know is that God He's got his word and wisdom for you already because he wants you to thrive. Here's, here's another way that I thought about this. When we align our lives to how God designed life, we thrive. When we align our lives to how he actually designed life, we thrive. And so maybe you're joining today and, and you've not been following him. Man, I'm glad you are here. And I encourage you to be here throughout this series because we are gonna be unpacking this for the next eight weeks. Maybe you're joining us today and you've been following Jesus. You call yourself a Christian, but if you're honest, you don't have much peace in the midst of chaos. And you would say, man, I want that. Like, I, I thought I'm a Christian. I thought I'm supposed to actually have peace in the chaos. And, and what I'd love to say to you is, yes, it's possible for you to have that. But specifically, we've gotta get grounded in God's word and wisdom so that we can have peace in the midst of any chaos that might come our way. Because when we align our lives to how God designed life, we thrive. So maybe you're a Christian joining us and you would say, yes, I prayed the prayer, I raised my hand, and yet I don't have the peace. I would ask you, is your life aligned to how God designed your life? And so that's what we're gonna do over these next number of weeks. We are gonna look at what does it mean to have our lives aligned to how God designed life so that you and I can thrive because that's what God longs for and desires for you and for me. And for everybody that you know, this isn't something he's trying to hold out from people. In fact, he gives it. He, we have his word. We have the Bible specifically so that we would have it and be able to be aligning our lives to him and to Jesus. And so we're gonna go on this journey together. And this morning specifically, what I want us to do is I want us to take a, a few minutes to be looking at the life of Jesus Jesus had chaos 
in his life. And specifically at the end of his life, he had chaos. And what I want us to do is take a look at how was it that Jesus was able to have peace in the midst of the chaos that happened in his life. And so today we're gonna jump into the book of Mark chapter 15, and this is specifically at Jesus' crucifixion, at his death, at the moment where utter chaos was taking him. Now Mark is an interesting guy. Mark is actually the first person to write an account of Jesus' life that's, that's actually survived and gotten to us. And Mark was not an actual disciple of Jesus. However, Mark is so intertwined into the early church as, as not an eyewitness, but as a writer of the eyewitness accounts. You see, Mark spent a lot of time with a guy named Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends and followers. He was one of his inner three closest people that he got to. And so what we know about Mark uh, from the book of Acts is that Mark's mother was, owned a house that Christians met in. And specifically when Peter was in jail, they were praying for him. Peter gets out of jail and he comes to their house. And so Peter has a close relationship with, with this guy, Mark. Mark later would go on and he would travel with a guy named Paul and Barnabas and they would go all over the region telling about Jesus and what had happened. And so Mark really, while he was not an eyewitness, he spent so much time with the eyewitnesses of Jesus. He knew and he was besieged by, by Christians, write this down so that we can pass it on to people. And so Mark goes about writing an eyewitness account of what people saw happen in the life of Jesus. And this is specifically at the end of Jesus's life. It's at the very end, he's at, he's at the crucifixion, he's on the cross, he is in that moment of chaos that's associated with death. Now, if you and I are honest with each other, there is a lot of chaos that can be associated with death, isn't there? A lot of what we do as people is trying to push death away from us. Whether it's we're trying to be more healthy and so we're working out a lot and we're drinking green smoothies uh, or whether it's we're paying doctors tons and tons and tons to try and keep us going. Here's one of the things. I have a number of friends that are physicians and they are amazing, wonderful people, but their death rate continues to be 100%. You get that, right? Like, there's no amount of trying to push off death that actually works. And so it's this very chaotic moment where many, many people struggle with peace in that moment. And here we are at Jesus' actual death. And that's where I want us to pick up today. Mark chapter 15, verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What an interesting statement for Jesus to make at his death. Up until this point, Jesus had had total trust and confidence in God. Jesus knows what God's plan is for him, yet he would say this, Right at the end, as we skip forward to verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. He says this right before he's about to die. Says, Mark says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, how he died was really important, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God, he gave testimony to who Jesus was. Now, I wanna come back to that statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This has given people trouble. People have struggled with this statement for years and years and years. Like, why would Jesus say that? Why would he think that God had forsaken him in that moment? Did God forsake him in that moment? Did God just leave him there to die? And what's interesting about that statement and what's interesting about what Jesus is doing is here is that on first reading, we may not quite understand 
why Jesus makes that specific statement. You see, that statement, Jesus is not actually saying this is how he feels. Jesus is specifically quoting a psalm. He's quoting a psalm from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, specifically Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was written by David, who was an ancestor of Jesus, and it was specifically known to be this messianic prophecy, this psalm talking about what was going to happen to the Messiah. And specifically, that psalm was written hundreds of years before Jesus actually walked on the earth and hundreds of years before he would go to the cross for crucifixion. And so what Jesus is doing, Jesus is quoting the very first line of that psalm because he knew to quote that first line would trigger in his followers not just that first line in the psalm, but the entire line, the entire psalm. And so what Jesus is saying at the very end of his life, when he's got barely any breath left in his lungs because to be crucified means you basically suffocate to death, and as he hangs there on the cross, suffocating, he's able to get out the quote to start this psalm, to start in the minds of the people who followed him and who would know this entire psalm, to start this entire psalm for them. And so what I want us to do is I want us to go through this psalm to understand why Jesus would quote this specific psalm. Psalm 22, verse one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There it is, that's the exact quote that Jesus uses to get this psalm going in the minds of his followers and the people who would hear it. He says, why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. And maybe you've felt this way in the midst of chaos before. Maybe you feel like you've cried out to God and you've got nothing. He says, yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. Jesus is saying to his followers, yes, it may seem as though God is not here, he is not present, but in verse three comes and he says, no, 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 God is the Holy One and he is enthroned and he is still in charge even in the midst of chaos happening here. He says, and you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. He's saying to his followers, watching what's happening on the cross and what's already happened, God delivered in the past. And you can trust, as my followers, you can trust that he will deliver again. He will come through. Jesus' words on the cross are not, oh, all hope is gone, I've been forsaken. No, he's trying to tell his followers and he's trying to tell us, no, God's going to come through. Verse five. He says, to you they cried out and were saved, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. He says, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. And this is where this, this, this specific psalm becomes very interesting. Jesus was scorned and despised by the people. He's put on the cross, not by the Romans, but by his own people calling for his own crucifixion. He's scorned and despised by them. He says, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. There's actually an inscription written on top of Jesus' cross at the crucifixion saying, King of the Jews, to mock him. And it's written in Latin and in Greek and in Aramaic just so no one will miss it. Verse eight, he trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. One of the thieves who sat on a cross next to Jesus said this. He said, hey, if you really are the son of God, why don't you let him come and rescue you and pull you off the cross and pull us with you? Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near. And maybe you are in that place today. You are in that place where trouble is near to you. And there is no one to help. Maybe you feel that. 
you feel the chaos that perhaps Jesus and his followers felt at this moment of crucifixion. He says, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. He says, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. This is what happens at crucifixion. As the body hangs on the cross for hours and hours and hours, eventually the strength gives out and the joints begin to come dislocated. He says, my heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. In John, John talks about how Jesus is pierced in the side and specifically blood and water come out separately, almost like wax coming out. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. In John, John also recounts, Jesus says from the cross, I'm thirsty. He's been out in the sun, hanging on this cross all day, literally suffocating to death. His mouth is dried. His tongue is stuck. He says, dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet, which they did to put Jesus on that cross. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They put Jesus in a place right at at the beginning beginning of the city so that people would walk in and out and see him. He was on display for people to see. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. They did this. They didn't want to tear Jesus' clothes, so instead they go and they cast lots to see who would actually get to take his clothing. Remember, this is hundreds of years before this that David writes this psalm about what would happen to the coming Messiah. It's not like Jesus has any control over whether they actually do this or not. Jesus can't like make this up and manufacture all of these things that David prophesies that are coming to pass here. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. He makes his cry and his appeal. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. And Jesus says this. He's saying this, remember, to his followers. He wants them to recount in their minds that he is saying, you are my strength, God. In the last moments of his life, as he's only got a few breaths left, he's still saying to his followers, no, God is my strength. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions, save me from the horns of the wild oxen. He says, I will declare your name to my people. Even in my last moments of death, I'm gonna do this. He says, in the assembly, I will praise you even though I've been beaten and I have been put on this cross in such a horrific way, I will still praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. You can hear Jesus saying this to his closest followers, saying, I know it looks like chaos. I know it looks like the end is here, but our God is strong and powerful and mighty, and we can still praise him, honor him, and revere him because he is gonna come through in a way that you are not expecting him to come through. He says, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live for every eternity, saying, is set for those in that relationship with God. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. He says, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. Those of you that are watching that know Jesus, you and I know 
because Jesus is quoting this on the cross saying this is going to happen. He's saying future generations, you are a future generation that is benefited from the faith of Jesus on the cross to proclaim the goodness of his God even in the most chaotic moment possibly of his entire life. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, that's you and I, but that's also for you and I to give to a people who are yet unborn. He has done it. He has done it. Jesus, speaking from the cross, quotes this psalm so that in the minds of his followers, it would be invoked that this is who their God is, that he is the one who has done it. He is the one who has saved. He is the one that imparts righteousness onto those of us which would be all of us, who are not righteous. And specifically, in this moment, he is not proclaiming that his God has forsaken and left him. In fact, he is proclaiming quite the opposite. He is proclaiming that his God is going to come through. And even though the chaos looks heavy, and even though it's dark, remember at the beginning, it, it, in Mark's gospel, he says it went dark from 12 to 3. Even though it seems dark and foreboding, Jesus, moments before he takes his last breath, he says, no, 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 no. I've got peace in my chaos right now. And one of the ways that he is able to have peace in that chaos is because of his knowledge of God's word. Jesus knows Psalm 22. As a young boy, he would have grown up being taught the Torah and taught the scriptures, committing those to heart and to memory. And so at the moment where chaos comes and strikes him, Jesus isn't thrown off by the chaos. And in fact, Jesus instills faith in the midst of the chaos. Why? Because he has God's word and God's wisdom planted firmly within his heart so that when the chaos would come, he would know who is his strength. He would know who would deliver. He would know who had already been there before time and time and time again. Jesus knew because God's word was how he had shaped his life. And he had literally wrapped his life around God's word and God's wisdom and being obedient to it. So my question For you, where will you turn in the chaos? Jesus turned to God's word in the midst of that chaos. Where will you turn? Friends, they may have some wisdom. Family, they may have some wisdom for you. I have great friends and a great family. There are plenty of times they don't have wisdom. You might have the same. I try and be a good friend and a good family member. There are definitely plenty of times I don't have wisdom. Where do you turn in the chaos? Where will you turn when it comes? To your kids? Will you sink yourself into their life so much that any any chaos that you feel, you, you just kind of push it out and vicariously live through them? Where will you turn? We try and numb the chaos, through alcohol, through drugs, sex, pornography. We try and numb that chaos there. Jesus offers peace in the midst of your chaos. My wife, not too long ago, uh, and, and one of our team members on the band, they Uh, had the privilege and honor of going to a woman in our church's hospital room and singing for her right before she passed. And I remember her coming uh, home later and and talking to me about the experience. And she had gone to the nurse's station uh, just to thank the nurses for what they did for her and and keeping her comfortable. And in this conversation, she relayed to me how, uh, as her and the nurse were talking about end of life, because this is part of the hospital they were in, and they were talking about end of life, um, the nurse said to her, you know, 
I heard you singing in there to her. The people who come in and they're at this place where they are departing, they're in the chaos of death ending their life. The ones who have faith don't struggle in here at all. She said, the ones who have no faith, it's terrible, the pain and agony they go through in this moment. Why? Because their peace has been tied to things of this world. And ultimately, this world is temporary. And while it is a good world that God created and gave to us, when we corrupted it with sin, everything within it became temporary and not lasting. Yet God's word is lasting and forever. And if we are willing to take and wrap our lives around how he designed life to actually be, like Jesus quoting Psalm 22, we will have the stability to have peace in the midst of that chaos. Being grounded in God's word and wisdom brings peace in our chaos. This past fall, as a church, we did a thing called Financial Peace University. And financial peace is done specifically so that people can understand what God's word has to say about money and how to be wise with that resource that God has given. And it's interesting as a pastor when you try and help people from a financial standpoint because there's definitely a pushback in modern culture that says pastors are only after your money. Let me just give you a little assurance. We're not after your money. We believe that God has plenty of money. If he needs some money, he'll make sure the church gets some money. He's got plenty. But Pastor Jerry and I last February as, as we were at a conference and we were talking and chatting, just praying, and, and we really felt God laid it on our hearts that for our people, they needed some of the, the wisdom of God when it came to finances. And that as pastors and as a church, we had a responsibility to teach people about what God says specifically about finances. And so we launched that this past fall and we really pushed for the whole church to go and do it. And some people were really on board, they were really excited about it and other people uh, were not. And, and they pushed back on why would the church talk about this? The church doesn't need to talk about this. Some people left our church specifically because we were doing it. And we didn't force people to do it, we just asked them. We said, hey, we believe that God has something more for you than what he wants from you. And specifically, if we align, we believe if we align our finances to the principles of God, it will help us thrive in life. And so we said, you know what, we're gonna do this, and we did it. And so many people in our church went through Financial Peace University last fall. And and they didn't know why they were doing it then. But one of the things that I've begun hearing over the past couple of weeks in talking to the people of our church is that they are so thankful that last fall they went through Financial Peace University and began living their lives from a financial standpoint in a way that God designed us to use and interact with money. And they began paying off debt. One of the things that Proverbs tells us is that the, the borrower is the slave to the lender. And so they began to take that principle, that wisdom from God, and place it into their life and pay off the debt that they had. They, they began to store up. There's a proverb that specifically talks about look at the ant. And what it does in its season, it works hard and it stores up so that when there's a season of lack, it has plenty stored up. And they begin to build their emergency fund. And these people that I've talked to in the past couple of weeks, do you know what they have in the midst of the coronavirus and the economic chaos and in the midst of job losses in an unprecedented number? They have peace. Do you know why they have peace? Because they chose 
to be grounded in God's word and wisdom when it came to their finances. And so now that we are all in a season of chaos, they have peace based on the word and wisdom of God being played out in their lives. This is why we are doing this series, Peace in the Chaos, because we believe that yes, from the financial standpoint, God has some things to say about how we live life, but there are so many other ways for us to be engaging with God, to learn his word, to learn his wisdom, so that we too, like Jesus, we can have peace in the midst of any chaos that would strike us that a coronavirus would come, that unprecedented job loss would come, and even though these are people that would not be of huge wealth and means that we would think about as, oh, they've got tons saved up, they've got these amazing jobs that they've had. No, 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 these are regular, ordinary people, service industry workers, who are saying, hey, you know what? Give some more hours to someone else because I've already planned and prepared for this chaos to be here based on what my God says. You and I can live in that place on a day in and day out basis. And that is what this series is specifically about. It's about getting us to that place where we thrive because we have wrapped our lives around God's wisdom that he is so generously given to us. And so as we go on this journey, I, I recognize there are some of you that as you watch and you're not a follower of Jesus, one of the things that I would say to you is that's okay. One of the great things about God's word and God's wisdom is his wisdom still holds true whether you believe in Jesus or not. And his wisdom holds true, and if you seek to apply his wisdom, you can apply his wisdom in your life before even saying yes to Jesus, and this is amazing. It will work in your life. There are people that went through FPU, Financial Peace University, who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who began to align their life to the wisdom of God, and they are thriving because of that. And so maybe you're watching and you need some peace in the midst of some chaos, I would encourage you, just give it a try. This is one of these great try before you buy types of moments with the Lord that he offers to you. Now, for some of you, you've known Jesus for a while. You've just lacked applying God's word and wisdom to your life. I wanna encourage you, let this be a season that you apply God's word and wisdom to your life. Don't be resistant for what he has for you, but lean into what he has for you to open yourselves up to it. And then there's some of you that you're watching today and quite honestly, uh, you've been hearing about Jesus and, and you've heard about some things he's done and you've maybe held some opinions of Jesus in the past but he's been doing something in your heart these past couple of weeks. In the midst of this chaos, he's been showing you, man, you were seeking peace long before coronavirus came, and you were filling it with things that were just temporary peace givers, and yet he, Jesus, offers you an eternal, lasting peace. And so if that's you, I wanna encourage you to do what the Apostle Paul says, he says in, Rome, in the book of Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God will raise him from the dead, you will be saved. That moment of chaos at the end of life, that moment in the hospital where so many people struggle with death because they don't have peace about what's coming next, you can settle that right here and now. Today, you can settle that. Over the past number of years, I've had the privilege of walking with some people as they began to consider who Jesus was, then make a decision to follow him and make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life. And as we walked through and had conversations leading to that point, one of the things that would come up with, with some of these guys that I'd talk with was they were afraid to make the decision to follow Jesus because they didn't know what the next step would be after that. They didn't know what that would mean for their life after that. They couldn't control what would happen in their life 
after that, let me say this to you today. You may be in that place where you've been resisting following Jesus because you don't know what's gonna happen after that. All you have to do is take the first step. And if this season of coronavirus has taught us anything, it's that control is just an illusion anyway. It is just an illusion. But you have a heavenly father who does have control and he has made a plan and he has offered you peace through Jesus. And so I would say to you, just take the first step today. I'm gonna pray here in just a minute and maybe that's you. Maybe you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus to make him your savior and you don't know what the, that looks like next. Don't worry about what it looks like next. Just worry about this moment where you know God is speaking directly to you right now. You know who you are. You know God is speaking directly to you, asking you to lay down, surrender, and follow. He wants to give you his peace. If that's you, I'm gonna pray a prayer and I invite you to pray it. Maybe pray it out loud. Maybe just pray it right there in your heart, in your home. Pray this prayer to ask Jesus to be your savior. Let's pray. Jesus, I come to you today recognizing that I don't have all the answers, recognizing that there is a lot of chaos going on in my life. Some of it's external, caused from other things, but some of it I cause. And I recognize my gap, I recognize my need for you, Jesus. I recognize my need for you to be my savior. And so I confess today with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you, Jesus, are the son of God and that God raised you from the dead after that horrible crucifixion that we just talked about. That was not the end. The end was when you raised back to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, today, I submit my life to you. Would you come, would you be my Lord, and would you be my Savior? Amen, amen. If you made that decision today, it is the greatest decision you will ever make. And our team in the chat window, they're gonna have some resources for you. We encourage you to click on that link, get connected, get ready for that next step. Know that your heavenly father loves you enough to give his son for you. And for all of us, let's commit. Let's commit to go on this journey for wisdom together. Let's commit over these next eight or nine weeks to be in God's word together. One of the things we wanna encourage everyone to do is as we go through these next couple of weeks, we're gonna read a proverb together, Monday through Friday. Every Monday through Friday, we're gonna go Proverbs 1 starting tomorrow. And we encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, go find the Bible app and in the app store, get a Bible. You can get it super easy. Get, get it in our app, in the Beach Church app. But we are gonna start reading God's word together. We are gonna start getting his wisdom and his word into our lives. We are gonna start aligning our lives in such a way that God would help us thrive through a season of utter chaos. And so as we do that, I wanna pray for you. And then we're gonna sing one last song today as our cry and as our prayer to God for what this next season holds for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his example in which on the cross in his moment of absolute utter chaos, he did not have a moment of failing faith in fact, he had a moment of creating more faith for us as followers. And he did that specifically through your word, God. He did it as he quoted Psalm 22. God, your word was so precious and important to Jesus as he walked on this earth. Would it be so for us? Would we be so grounded in the word and wisdom of God that anytime peace seemed fleeting, we would be able to go back to your word, back to your promises and recognize that in any chaos that comes at us, your peace is available to us.
And would we be a people that that is so? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.